Here. You may recall last week we were reading about Jacob and how he wrestled with God and got a new name, Israel. We're going to be continuing with that thread from Genesis. Now we'll be reading in the 33rd chapter, the first 11 verses. Pray that our hearts and minds are open to hear what Scripture is saying to us, the church. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went out ahead of him, bowing himself to the ground seven times and came, until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, and he embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise and her children drew near and bowed down. And finally, Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, What do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, No. Please, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly, to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Since you have received me with such favor, please accept my gift that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have everything I want. So he urged him, and he took it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May all who have heard these words trust that they come from our good and gracious God. May we trust him and his word now and always. This time I invite Diana for the good news message. Did I not read John? No, no that's funny. I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I was losing it. I am having a week, folks. I am sorry. It has just been too much going on. I need to be someplace by myself for a while and combobulate, but I'm not there. Thank you for helping me. Remember, I need to read the New Testament passage as well. Along that same line, let us hear this reading from John. Here I'll be reading beginning in chapter 11, verse 17, going down through verse 27. The section of this chapter we did not read is Jesus being told that Lazarus was sick and Jesus delaying in coming. And then we pick up as he has now decided to travel to where everything is going on. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Gotta get prepped here. You may see this again if we have kids. <laughs> so, are you a floater or a sinker? <laughs> I've got some objects here. And you're just going to have to trust me. Or if somebody wants to come up and play along. So what do you think? Is it going to float or is it going to sink? Float. You're right. It floats. What about this? Is it going to float or sink? Yep, it sunk. Let's see. How about this cute little cow? What do you think? Floater. Yep, it's a floater. Float. It did float. I think it was supposed to sink. <laughs> I imagine this is going to float if that floats. Yep, it does. Well, our story today is from Matthew 14. Do you remember um, when Jesus fed the 5,000 people with just the five loaves of bread and the two fish? Well, after he had finished that, do you remember that he told the disciples to get in their boat? and go to the other side of the lake while he went up to the mountains to be alone and to pray. Well, <clears throat> while they were going to the other side of the lake, a wind came and water began to get rough and they got, the disciples got afraid and then they saw Jesus coming toward them, walking on the water. And when Peter saw Jesus, he became excited and he said, Lord, if that's really you, let me walk to you on the water. And what did Jesus say? Come to me. When Peter climbed out of the boat, do you think he saw it? No. He was walking on the water to Jesus. But then he began to look around. He felt the strong winds and he saw the uh, waves getting crazy and he became afraid and he began to sink and he cried Jesus help me save me and Jesus reached out his hand and saved Peter and he said to you said to him oh you of little faith why did you doubt did you notice as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus he was able to walk on water but when he took his eyes off of Jesus he began to sink I think that's a huge lesson for us that when we go through life you know there's going to be storms there's going to be wind and there's going to be waves that come but as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus he will keep us above water when we don't trust him and and start to trust our own ability and think that we can do it without him that's when we begin to sink let's go to him and pray Heavenly Father we thank you that you have called us to trust you and to keep our eyes on you. And when we do, we can get through this life. Lord, we just thank you that you, you are our shield and you are our portion. You are all we need. So help us to keep our eyes focused on you. We pray in Jesus' name. I hope this section of the reading of Genesis struck you a little differently. How Jacob had sent over all his belongings, all his beloved wives and children to the other side, and he stayed behind. That they were out in where the approaching warriors of Esau were coming, and he was by himself, not necessarily in safety, but he was not out in front for certain. 
Yet in this reading in Genesis 33, we see that now he has placed himself in front. He has gotten out ahead of them to be the first one to encounter his brother. He was in a position of leadership. He was in a position to stand firm. I'm sure he was still afraid, but he knew more that God was with him and that he could be okay. Are we living in that fashion? Are we following the living way of our God? Or are we spending more time cowering in fear, living in uncertainty? Do we have all sorts of things that are troubling us? The answer to that is yes. If you're alive, you have things that are troubling you. This world is hard. I know many people have tried to order that easy button that you see in that commercial for a certain home office supply store, but the reality is there is no easy button in life. There is nothing you can push to make everything simple. There is no pill you can take to solve all of your problems. As it's so often discovered, if you actually get a magazine that has some advertisement for something, it will have one page that talks about what it'll do for you, and then it has that tiny, almost illegible print that's about two to three pages of side effects include. <laughs> if you ever read the side effects, you'll never take any medication. The reality of trusting our God, the side effects are yes, you're not in control, but since you're not in control truly anyway, that doesn't really count, does it? God has always been in control, whether we submit to God or not. The question comes into what we can actually control, which is our thoughts, our feelings, and our responses to what happened. Notice I didn't say our emotions. Those are things that our body does when stuff happens. Do you know if you're in a situation like I sometimes find myself in and you see a snake and it automatically sets off this fear response in you that that takes about 60 to 90 seconds to completely wash out of your body? That you'll have this increase in heart rate, this increase in hearing inside and everything as your body is trying to make certain that snake is going to get you or most likely for around here in Tennessee, is it just a rat snake or is it a snake that might actually hurt you? How do we respond to those things? The reality is you can choose to take that one emotion and continue living in that excitement and that stress in all of that. Or you can stop and go in a living fashion with our God, a living way. The reality of our reading from Genesis it's just another one of the many examples in Scripture where we need to stop and wrestle with God and then live differently. This presentation of this event is very one-sided. We don't know why Esau was coming to his brother. That's the reality of so many things in our lives that we get nervousness and uncertainty about. We may not know their actual intent. Jacob had assumed He's coming to get even with me for all the evil that I did to him earlier in life. In reading here, it would seem that Esau had no intention of doing evil. He was just out traveling with his 400 men. We don't really know if it changed Esau's perception that he got this huge gift from his brother, that he saw him coming humbly to him. That's the reality of how we have to go into things. We don't know what the result will be, but God is calling us to live in that happy and healthy living way of trusting that God is going to take care of us. It's not easy to do. Please, I confess wholly and completely, I'm too often not living in a living way. It's so easy to get out of sorts. As Diane was going through her children's message there, that good news message about what will sink and what will float. I thought of the folks who were out cutting wood with one of the prophets, and one of them had borrowed an axe, and as sometimes happens, the head flew off the axe and fell into the water, and the person was so distraught because it wasn't only 
that he lost the axe head, he could no longer be a productive worker, it wasn't his axe head to lose. But as God often does throughout Scripture, the prophet prayed, the axe head raised up to the top of the water, and he handed it back to him. The question, are we trusting God to fetch our axe head for us? Are we trusting that God is going to take care of this situation that we don't know how it's going to work out? As I said, Scripture is full of many examples of this. This one here with Lazarus. Who knows who could have prayed over Lazarus and changed the effect of his life except God had a plan for what to happen. As Martha said, Lord, had you been here, he would have been alive. But as I mentioned, or, no, excuse me, second time preaching this sermon, Jesus intentionally delayed. He knew what was going to happen, and he waited because he needed to have a teaching moment with the people. Painful reality for your life and mine, we're a teaching moment every day. We're teaching people all sorts of actions of how they should live their life depending on how we live ours. Me being the person that I am, I didn't want to put too many Christian stickers on my vehicle because I was always afraid I wasn't going to be behaving as a Christian should behave when they're driving. I can put a big T on the back of it because people know how Tennessee people are. I mean, you know. I didn't want to be that pastor that got pulled over because the cop thought my car must have been stolen because of what I was either yelling at somebody or some sign I might have shared that wasn't happy and loving or who knows what. I'm broken and human just as all of you are. But God is calling us to live differently, to have a living way, not the worldly way that says if somebody does this, you're okay to do that. Or if someone does that, then you shouldn't do the same thing. You know, we have to live as God calls us to live, not how we think we should live. The other powerful part here of what Jesus' interaction with Martha, Martha is, is, you know, she's saying, yes, I have that view of the land faith. I know there's going to be a time when we'll all be living with God. Jesus is saying, no, I am the resurrection life, and I'm here now. I'm impacting your life here, Martha. But he's also saying, I'm here now impacting your life, Charles and Sarah and David. God's impacting all our lives right now as the resurrection and the life in this moment. The question is, is are we listening for what God is saying to help us have that living way? Or are we living in the way of what fell on top of us? what came to us that we weren't expecting, what happened that we weren't ready for. I am the resurrection and the life is a call for us to jump out of the life that we found ourselves. As Diane said, to jump out of the boat and walk on the water. Do what we think is impossible, not because we think we can do it, but because God is saying, trust me. Trust me that I'll help you through whatever sickness or struggle you're facing. Trust me that I can help you find what you really need in life. Not more of this part of creation or more of that aspect of creation. Not more tranquility or less in your schedule, but trust in me. Follow me. Live in this living way. Martha didn't respond saying exactly, I get that you're the resurrection of the life. She said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. She doesn't understand yet what resurrection and the life truly is, just as we don't now. I've read through many theologians. None of us truly comprehend 
As the joke was told at seminary, why are the seminary professors' lights on at night? They're still completing their readings from when they were in seminary. They're still trying to understand all this deep base of knowledge we hope we've gathered about how great and mighty and wonderful God is and how we can live it out. The reality for each of us every day is we have to discover anew what it means to have that living way in this day. We don't know what's going to happen. We might think we know, but it's like the weather here in Tennessee. They can tell you with 100% certainty it's not going to rain. The next minute you're going to be drenched. Or they'll tell you you're going to get drenched, don't cut any hay, and then you don't cut any hay, and it's a beautiful day for curing hay or building a house, or whatever we might think we need the weather person to tell us to plan for. God is the resurrection and the life. Christ is alive and well and guiding each of us in that living way. It's not going to be a clear road map that we get to see how our entire life is laid out. It's going to be a daily by daily, moment by moment, one step after the other, trusting that God is here. Perhaps we should do it in a more humble fashion as they did when they finally brought the Ark of the Covenant back to the temple. That as David was leading them in, he was dancing fervently, he was praising God humbly. Six steps and then they would praise again. Six more steps and then praise again. talk to my mother as she's getting better from her hip replacement. She says, I give thanks and to God every time I make a step and don't fall down. I'm just in that uncertain spot. I'm trying not to rely on the walker, but yet I have to keep trying and hoping I'm not going to fall. I'm praying that we can grow more into that living way. I don't think any one of us is there yet. Some of us are farther along than others. But then we'll end up in a different situation and we'll see that, no, we're all still needing that grace upon grace upon grace. Let us be humble and give thanks that God continues to give that grace. That we have amazing grace in abundance. That we can live differently. That we can enjoy that living way that God pours out for us in an abundance that we cannot consume. That we can give thanks and praise that God is with us each and every day. And we can be so much different because he is with us. To the resurrection and the life, to Christ be all honor and glory and praise this day and forevermore. Amen and amen. Family of God, let us join together in our second hymn, number 529. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hymn 529 in the red hymn. <laughs>
tonight, I invite you to remain standing if you are able and join in our affirmation of faith, the Nicene Creed. You'll be doing its number 717 in your red hymnal. Let us affirm our faith with the Nicene Creed. Let us read together. I believe in, in one, one God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, maker of, of heaven and earth, and, and of all things visible and, and invisible, and in, and in one Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ the only, the only begotten, begotten Son of God, God begotten of the Father before all worlds, worlds God, God of God, God light of light, very God of very God, God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he came shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. 